Well, I worked for the company all up with a haulage of the um, timber from the bush on the trucks, sawn timber from the mills, first to the rail and then on to Brisbane. Uh, got bigger tractors to keep up with the output of the mills and I spent 35 years with that company. During the early part of the 1930s, Australian men and women fought hard to maintain a rugged but enjoyable way of life. The building of the world's longest viaduct bridge was a major achievement for a community that was in the heart of a depression. The Hornybrook Bridge was this nation's first major venture between the public and private sectors, and by any measure, was a huge success. Bridges are fascinating structures. Quite simply, they join two pieces of isolated land, or span a deep ravine. What is perhaps more fascinating is the respect people have for bridges of all kinds. Proof of the respect that people have for bridges comes in the saying particularly used with the gullible, if you believe that, I've got a bridge you might like to buy. <laughs> this saying originates from the 20th century con artist George C. Parker, who allegedly sold the Brooklyn Bridge numerous times to naive investors. The Hornybrook Bridge may not have been sold to a gullible public, but it still has the same mystique. Constructed between 1932 and 1935, the Hornybrook Bridge is one of the first road toll facilities in Queensland to be authorised by a special Act of Parliament. It is notable as a major public work, constructed by private enterprise at a time of great economic depression in Queensland. The bridge was the major impetus for the development of Redcliffe. Its significance also lies in its relationship to the vision of its builder, Manuel Hornibrook, to develop the potential of the city of Redcliffe. Well, it really opened up the main route into Redcliffe because uh, prior to that, the only way to get to Redcliffe was by ferry across from Sandgate or Anzac Avenue, which was built round about, I think it was open round about 1926, uh, became very impassable from time to time with flooding and stuff, particularly out at Saltwater Creek. So the bridge really gave a... Uh, uh, a constant route to Redcliffe uh, flood free. I don't think the bridge was uh, ever closed except maybe in uh, one or two uh, very bad cyclones. But uh, it really opened up the peninsula and uh, that's probably evidenced by the number of people that used to come here. I think Redcliffe in those days had a population around about 12,000 people from memory and uh, at holiday times that's, those crowds used to just uh, bump up to anywhere from 60 to even 100,000 people I heard. Prior to the construction of the Hornybrook Viaduct, the Redcliffe Peninsula was accessed by ferry and road. Road transportation was of great concern to the residents of the Redcliffe area. During times of wet weather, the Redcliffe Road, running via Petrie, frequently became impassable to vehicles. Several schemes have been drafted to improve the accessibility of the Redcliffe area to vehicle owners and also to the growing day tripper market having seaside holidays at Redcliffe. Hornybrook had holidayed in this area and saw the development potential of Redcliffe being linked by road to Brisbane. The onset of the depression of 1929 to 1933 prompted Hornybrook to plan and construct a road viaduct across from Redcliffe to Sandgate. Well, as I mentioned before, the number of people that came here was a great boon to business. The number of campus particularly, uh, oh, that really set the uh, peninsula ahead for tourism and, uh, and business opportunity. They had, I can remember seeing photos of campers. They used to camp the whole of the way around the peninsula from uh, Clontarf and Woody Point, uh, to Scotts Point, Margate, Sutton's Beach, Redcliffe in front of the police station, out to Scarborough in front of the uh, Scarborough Hotel and even out to Reef Point. So there was thousands of people there but on top of that uh, it opened up opportunities for employment because you had uh, maintenance people of course with the bridge, you had the toll collectors and there was even a new bus service started which was the uh, Hornybrook uh, bus service. M.R. Hornybrook was a dynamic man, one of those people destined for greatness. He was confident, diligent and always maintained a keen focus on every project he undertook. In 1931, 
Hornybrook approached the state government with a proposal to construct a toll bridge linking the southern part of Redcliffe with the Sandgate area. Initially, this proposal was rejected. After further consultation with the state government, an act of parliament was pushed through, allowing for the involvement of private enterprise in the construction of toll facilities. I believe um, Warnybrooks themselves uh, decided they needed uh, good quality timber and uh, they found it round Kilcoy and Jimna and I think they just contacted local uh, timber cutters there and, uh, and they were lucky they were there cutting at the time. Oh, well, I think at the time the timber, the timber cutters used to get a shilling a hundred to cut the timber and uh, I think it was four bob a hundred I used to get to snig it. So that would be, work that out in your modern day, Carl. <laughs> and uh, your month's work would finish. You'd get a statement from the local manager in, in the office at the mill. And then you would get your cheque at the 20th of the next month. But uh, it would never be posted to you. If you were missed out when they brought the pays up to the, to the mill for the mill staff, uh, well, it might be a week over or something like that before you got your cheque for the next. Uh, Dad's name was Frederick McEwen and uh, he was born in Kilcoy, or not in Kilcoy actually, Monsondale. He uh, cut a lot of timber for um, Yedna and the um, Queensland Soft and Hardwood Mills. Uh, eventually he got into... Um, uh, when the Hornybrook Bridge was being uh, built, he got into cutting the girders and that sort of thing, and uh, the story is he cut about 80% of them. Work officially commenced on the project on June the 8th, 1932, but its first 18 months' progress was limited due to a lack of finance. The entry portals at either end of the bridge were completed in early 1933, but the continuing depression forced Hornybrook to find additional funds to achieve the planned 1935 completion date. Finally, a major flotation was supported by a £100,000 loan from the AMP Society, a loan that was guaranteed by the state government. Over 2.5 million super feet of timber was needed to provide girders and decking on the bridge. Two sawmills were bought specially to process timber from the Mount Mee and Conondale ranges, and 250 timber getters were employed to cut the required amount of timber. Yeah, well, Seth Skinner was, um, he was one of the uh, major timber cutters up around Jibna there for many years, but um, he decided to give it away and go into buses and uh, he spent many years with his um, bus line but uh, passed away a few years ago. Other than that I don't know a lot about him but um, he, um, he used to tell a few stories about different ones that uh, uh, worked up around there and uh, one fellow in particular who uh, went to Mr Hornybrook and asked him if he had a job for him and he had an old flat top truck and uh, Hornybrook told him if he could um, get about four girders on the truck and that he could bring them back from Jimda to the, to the bridge. So uh, he found his way up there and uh, they loaded four girders on there for him and uh, when they uh, went to tie him up he only had a half inch rope so the other fellows up there decided that that wouldn't hold those girders on there so they loaned him some chains and that, and, uh, and they sent him on his way. But uh, he got to the first hill and uh, the truck wouldn't go up, so they had to unload one girder. Uh, anyhow, he, uh, he got over that one, and uh, then he got caught on another one, and he had to unload another girder. By the time he got down to Edna, he only had one girder, and uh, so he offloaded that. He reckoned it was no good going all the way back to, <laughs> to Hornybrooks with one girder, so he offloaded that, and... Uh, and the other uh, chaps from up at the uh, loading dock, they uh, got down to Edna and found out he'd discarded all the girders and their chains weren't there so that they'd loaned him. So they thought he was a bit of a lousy scumbag and called him that and 
But when they got down to Kilcoy with their loads, uh, they found that he had left the uh, change with the local storekeeper, so they decided he wasn't too bad a bloke after all. But he never got any good as he never came back. <laughs> Concrete was supplied from the QCL works at Dara, with the two portals being the first significant structures in Queensland to use material from this source. The last plank on the viaduct was spiked into place on September the 7th, 1935. The bitumen road surface was laid in less than three weeks, setting an Australian record. The construction of the bridge was similar to other bridges in Queensland, but when it was completed, it was the longest road viaduct built over water in the Southern Hemisphere. The Hornybrook Highway Bridge is 2.6 kilometres long. It's a timber and concrete bridge that spans Hayes Inlet and Bramble Bay between Clontarf Point and Brighton, linking Sandgate to Redcliffe. It has identical rendered concrete portals at each end and two rises along its length which permit small boats to pass underneath. The viaduct was opened to road traffic on October the 4th, 1935, foreshortening the road journey by several hours. Also, a special coordinated road rail bus service was inaugurated by the company to convey commuters between Sandgate and Redcliffe. Yeah, it was already established. They used to have their garage and, and uh, offices at, at the Sandgate railway station. And they were green and, green and yellow buses, Hornybrook buses. And they only used to go from Sandgate to Redcliffe. They did, didn't do the round trips like they do now, like out into the suburbs or anything like that. It was just, you used to have to walk down to the front esplanade and that's where your bus stops were, all on the main drag. Roy Atkins is the son and namesake of the first Hornybrook tollmaster and recalls some of the mischief he and his friends created living so close to the bridge. His sister, Joy Brennan, recounts a lifestyle that was so typical of that post-depression, post-war period. I was 13 when we were in the toll house and I used to ride a push bike from there to Margate, Sutton Beach, to Simon's store. That's where I used to work. Wednesdays, them days, used to be a half day. You'd work from 8 in the morning to 11 and the shops would close. And I'd ride all the way home from there to the toll house and then Dad would say, right, over to golf because that was Ladies' Day over at Golf. That was 1935. Fast forward to 1975, in the same location, and things have changed a fair bit. The Redcliffe area is now quite affluent, the residents are enjoying a high standard of living, and big changes are about to take place. By the 1970s, increasing road volumes brought the investigation of a replacement structure capable of carrying the additional traffic. The Hornybrook Highway franchise was surrendered in 1975 after 40 years of operation by the company. At this time, the main roads department assumed responsibility for maintaining the structure. The Hornybrook Highway was a major catalyst in accelerating the urban development of the Redcliffe Peninsula and its surrounding areas. Its planning, operation and construction represented a major innovation at a time of extreme economic crisis. A replacement viaduct was authorised by Main Roads in 1977 to cope with the increasing traffic flows to and from the Redcliffe Peninsula. The Houghton Highway, as the new bridge was named, opened to traffic in 1979. The Hornybrook Highway was closed to vehicular traffic with the opening of the replacement structure and has since been used as a pedestrian thoroughfare and a bikeway. Well, I worked for the company all up with a haulage of the... Um timber from the bush on the trucks, sawn timber from the mills, first to the rail and then on to Brisbane. Uh, got bigger tractors to keep up with the output of the mills and I spent 35 years with that company. With rising traffic levels on the old Hornybrook Bridge in the 1970s, the Department of Main Roads investigated the construction of another structure to increase capacity and cope with future demand. The bridge was uh uh, was mooted for by my father who was a local member of parliament at the time and prior to that he'd been the mayor of, uh, of the city of Redcliffe and uh, he was pushing for this bridge for a long time, the, the new bridge, because the old bridge, the Hornibrook uh, Highway, just couldn't cope with the traffic and, uh, and so while he was the member of parliament it was, 
it was built by the government, it was the government authority that uh, built it, and, uh, and he was a member at the time and uh, he had the honour for it to be named after him. The government authorised construction of a new bridge in 1977 and the Houghton Highway opened on the 20th of December 1979 by the then Premier of Queensland, the Honourable Sir Joe Biocchi peterson At the opening day they opened the bridge and, uh, and allowed people to uh, walk across and one of the local charities uh, even charged a, uh, a fee for the privilege and uh, that was a good community fundraiser. But I can remember my mother got there early, naturally, for the opening of the bridge and uh, which was at the Brighton end or the southern end and uh, they had all the official seats there and there was a gentleman sitting in the front row and uh, she was a bit perturbed to see that someone is sitting in the front row and she walked up to him and she said, oh, excuse me, sir, she said, but uh, I think you'll have to sit down the back because these seats are reserved for the uh, uh, official guests. And he said, uh, I'm Ralph Hunt, the Federal Minister for Transport. The Houghton Highway is named after the Honourable James Jim Houghton, former member for Redcliffe and Speaker. Yes, and uh, my father... Uh, He's been compared to uh, Mr Hornibrook uh, in many ways because they were both visionaries and uh, when that bridge was built, the New Houghton Highway, he said it's got to be six lanes in, in width and uh, the government laughed at him at the time but uh, time has proved him correct because uh, we really do need a six lane bridge there and uh, even before all the equipment was removed, after the bridge was even built, uh, he said no, while it's still here, let's let's still keep going ahead with uh, further lanes. And that was proven within another six months after the bridge was built. They, it was three lanes, two each way and a stopping lane. Uh, they had to add that uh, extra lane to, and made it a tidal flow because it just couldn't cope with the extra traffic. Without any option to rejuvenate the old Hornybrook Bridge, in October 1982, the Department of Main Roads ordered an investigation into modifying the Houghton Highway, just 10 months after it opened. Facing an awkward situation where the new bridge would not deliver any increased capacity, the modification of the bridge was to be urgently completed within 12 months. A notable characteristic of the Houghton Highway, other than its significant length, is the particularly rough surface and therefore ride quality. In addition, each concrete span has a slight concave curve, so a distinct corrugated ride is felt when driving over the bridge. These unfinished surface characteristics are due to the absence of a bitumen overlay. In February 2004, an RACQ survey found that the Houghton Highway was the number one pain in the neck for Queensland motorists. When the Houghton Highway was built, it was going to be two lanes into Brisbane and the old Hornibrook Highway would be two lanes out, or vice versa, and uh, that never happened because uh, the Hornibrook was found to be in such need of repair that uh, the Houghton Highway was the only one that uh, was put into service and uh, Redcliffe's had traffic problems even since the time that the Houghton Highway was open in 1979 to the present time. Respondents identified problems such as insufficient capacity, problems with tidal flow or an accident or breakdown on the bridge causing major congestion and an inappropriate speed limit of 60 kilometres an hour. The lack of consideration given by authorities to another bridge crossing angered motorists. New concerns about the increasing traffic demands and questions about the capacity of the Houghton Highway started in the late 1990s. The issue was agitated every time a crash caused delays, with the closure of one or two lanes or the entire bridge, while the scene was investigated then cleared up. Similarly, vehicle breakdowns on the bridge blocked lanes, also causing congestion and delays. Um, with the network um, getting more congested, um, with more traffic that we're seeing on, on, on the roads these days. Um, we can manage the traffic better um, and monitor the traffic. Um, whenever there's an incident, we call, we have a, a relationship with the emergency services. Emergency services respond and deal with the traffic and then the traffic control centre can monitor the, the outer perimeters of the incident to see what the traffic is doing. In order to dispel public concern, the Department of Main Roads ordered an upgrade into the bridge's tidal flow system. Commissioned in 2002 at a cost of $1.8 million, this upgrading included the replacement of the overhead arrow and cross signals with brighter displays. There was monitoring of the traffic flows and conditions with supervision of the system data and a view of the bridge by CCTV at the remote Traffic Management Centre in Woolloongabba, Brisbane. 
Operators were, for the first time, also able to close and open lanes as required from the remote location. The upgrade project suffered delays, compelling the Transport and Main Roads Minister, the Honourable Steve Bredhauer, to thank the Redcliffe residents for their patience. Just six months later, the Minister apologised for extensive delays after the system failed. A council contractor cut both the main and backup power supplies to the tidal flow system just before 10 o'clock in the morning. Evening peak hour traffic was severely disrupted and banked up for several kilometres as the bridge fell into safe mode. There was just one lane open in each direction for over 10 hours until Energex reconnected the power at 8pm. Um, if there's a, a major failure with the system, um, Main Roads has got uh, plans in place that uh, if we lose the control system totally, we can put physical devices in. Generally, you'll find that uh, it'll either be one half of the bridge um, that will go into failure mode, where we can maintain one half of the bridge open, which still may require some physical devices to go out, but we've got that in the planning and we can make that happen uh, very responsibly. Okay, the system's designed, if, the, if, if it does go into failure, we, we call it a safe mode, where the centre lane will be disabled and um, you'll get no vehicles allowed to, be, uh, to drive on the centre lane until the system has been rectified. Continuing disquiet about the bridge and calls for it to be duplicated or replaced were persistently rejected by the government. However, within three months, the Queensland Premier, the Honourable Peter Beatty, issued a statement announcing a study into when a new Redcliffe Bridge might be built. A reason for this change of position included campaigning by the Redcliffe City Council and a study they commissioned into the duplication of the bridge. Well, I think everybody on the north side of Brisbane will be uh, main beneficiaries. You should see the number of cars that come through Redcliffe and the peninsula from properties further out north, you know, from Deception Bay, Marumba Downs and, uh, and Caboolture areas. People come down there because the main highways are getting choked and uh, they use Redcliffe uh, and the highway, for want of a better word, as a, a rat running uh, exercise. So if the uh, bridge is, uh, the new bridge comes into being, a lot of that traffic will uh, uh, not be bogged up on the, uh, uh, or clogged up on the Anzac Avenue, but uh, that traffic will move uh, much freer and it'll, I'm sure it'll uh, service all of those uh, parts in, uh, in the north of Brisbane, not just Redcliffe, but it will be a big burn to Redcliffe at the same time. Also, the powers-to-be would have been aware of a community frustrated by the apparent lack of interest in the matter by the state government. The duplication of the Houghton Highway has now been announced and is a carbon copy of the existing bridge. Like the original intention when the bridge first opened, it will incorporate a shared pedestrian and cycling footway. This time, however, it is to be separated from traffic by a concrete barrier, thereby being much safer. The actual construction of the bridge will only take two years. We needed the extra year up front to design it and also to consult with the community to make sure that it meets all of the stakeholders' needs. The contract will actually be awarded late this year, that's 2007, for construction starting either late this year or early 2008. But the actual bridge will be open to traffic at the end of 2009. The existing bridge will be converted for three lanes of southbound traffic, with the new bridge carrying northbound traffic. Engineering standards have changed a great deal since 1932. We build bridges for heavier loads and we build them for safer operating conditions. So there will always be a difference between something built in 1932 and something built now. The biggest differences are in the materials that are used for building the bridge. The existing uh, Hornibrook bridge is built from concrete down in the substructure with timber superstructure on top some 12 million super feet of timber. The existing Houghton Bridge and the new duplicate are both built predominantly from precast concrete, which is much more able to stand up to the harsh marine environment. The other things that are different is the, the height. The existing Hornibrook Highway Bridge is quite low. The Houghton Highway Bridge was lifted up a little more and the, exist, the new bridge will be 5.4 metres higher than the original Hornibrook Bridge. Things that have changed since then also are the available technology. Um, we're able to build longer spans, so we need less piers in the actual bay. In terms of the similarities, they're both 
round about the same length, the new one will be slightly longer, and the construction techniques that were used back in 1932 haven't changed a whole lot to today. Just in relation to uh, things that have happened in Redcliffe since the highway, the Hornibrook Highway was opened, uh, as I say, it, w it became a lifeline really to Redcliffe and uh, council used that lifeline uh, in that uh, we never had a water supply in Redcliffe. Uh, now Redcliffe has a water supply and a lot of it comes from Brisbane across the highway. You know, there's, uh, uh, there's water pipes underneath the, uh, the Hornibrook Highway. And uh, with the development that's uh, gone since then, it really did open up uh, Redcliffe. Mr. Mr. Hornibrook, uh, he had a lot of land at uh, Clontarf, which when the bridge opened, he sold that land at Clontarf. He had acres and acres of it. And uh, he sold that land to, uh, to form the, the first Peninsula Golf Club. And I think he sold it for something like about 1,450 pounds, which is uh, quite... Uh, a very, very cheap sum. Some people that have come to here for a visit, which might have only been for a week or two, they've stayed and some of those people are now, uh, you know, generational. They've, they've been here, uh, their kids are here, their grandkids are here now. They just stay in Redcliffe's a community like that, that uh, it has bonds. Uh, my family, for example, has been here since about 1880s. And uh, I should be rich, but, uh, uh, but there's more to life uh, when you come to Redcliffe than trying to amass money because it's a lifestyle, and it's the lifestyle that really gets people. The old bridge is now experiencing problems of decay, including the cracking of the decking surface caused by rotting planks, the corrosion of steel in the concrete piers, and white ants in the girders. A third bridge is to be built beside the current concrete structure in order to cope with current and future traffic flows. Sadly, as with the cycle of life, the Hornybrook Bridge will be demolished and yet another phase of history will pass. The Hornybrook Bridge is a monument to public and community enterprise and of special pride to the people who live in the district. This is despite the delays and procrastination in the approval processes. A major public project that involved the whole community, a thing of the past? Will we ever again see great projects like the Hornybrook Highway or the Story Bridge? Ponder this thought. Do you really care? And if so, what are you going to do about it? We posed that question some years ago, and now in 2011, the Hornybrook Bridge is being demolished. We spoke with Queensland Main Roads Minister Craig Wallace. In October 1935, an historic piece of infrastructure was opened in Queensland, our original Hornybrook Bridge. In those days, it cost about uh, 10 cents to cross that bridge in a car and 5 cents in a motorbike. How times have changed. We've got our brand new Ted Smout Bridge, $315 million. That was opened earlier this year. A lot of people say to me, what are we doing with that old original structure from 1935? Unfortunately, we've got to uh, pull down most of it. Uh, it's far exceeded its life expectancy. Uh, a lot of it's treated with arsenic and would pose a danger uh, to that local community. Now, if we were to uh, put it back into its original state, it means we'd have to cut down a lot of trees to replace that, that wood there. So we're pull, pulling down most of that structure to make it safe, uh, recycling what timber we can for some of our bridges right across Queensland, and there's some very good timber there that we'll put to use. And on the Redcliffe side, we'll uh, make about 100 metres of it into an historical portal for the community to remember uh, well into the future. Given responsibility for the deconstruction of the Hornybrook Bridge is Greg Taylor, Managing Director of Ironbark Demolition. Juanita Grayson asked him whether he expected any opposition from the local community toward the demolition. In the course of the demolition, you may come across some opposition to the project. How would you deal with well, that? The public, if uh, understand how deteriorated it is, it's uh, it's not possible to, to retain it as it is. Um, certain components will be retained. Obviously, the portals here very significant, and uh, but due to the poor state, it's become dangerous not only uh, to the public on top of it, but anyone that happens to pass underneath it in a boat. It's quite there's actually components just falling. It's uh, it's just not feasible to rebuild mm -hmm. and the trees simply aren't around to, if it was to be reconstructed in, in a similar way that the timber is simply not there anymore.
Well, the bridge was constructed in 1935, primarily out of timber. What is the condition of that timber today, and is there much of it that can be recycled? Uh, a lot of it can. Uh, for example, you know, a bridge girder could be nine metres long. Four or five metres of that particular piece is reusable, mm -hmm. but it could be ready to fall in the water because the ends of either white ants or dry rot. But it'll be a long time before we know the exact percentage, but we recycle every piece possible. Every single piece? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that much of the timber to be re uh, recycled is iron bark, although not all of it. Yeah. Um, is this timber valuable and how will it be disposed? Oh yeah, it, it's very valuable. Um, it, it's a long process to, to remill it, reuse it. Uh, there's certain contaminants that have to be dealt with. Uh, obviously the old rusty steel before any uh, resawing can be done, remilling. Uh, but a lot of it will end up back in houses, clubs, restaurants, mm -hmm. buildings, um, as much as possible. And do you cut any of it on the bridge while you're there? Uh, no, we, we, we actually dismantle the whole bridge without a chainsaw. Uh, environmental reasons mainly, mm -hmm. but and also if there is good timber, that it's more valuable if you cut it up or if, you, know, you, you can't put it through a saw if it's too short, and the longer the better. When we spoke with the Main Roads Minister recently, he commented that part of the northern end of the bridge will be reconstructed. How will that come about? Given that the state government has recognised that the Hornybrook Bridge is a significant local landmark, will there be any part of the bridge that is left to the community for posterity? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, this, actually we, we, we're finding the best of the best components for reconstruction. There'll be uh, nine spans rebuilt uh, to look or as, as constructed back many years ago. Mm -hmm. There is also, obviously these portals will stay, uh, some fishing platform and uh, there's other parts that will be there for display for the public. Obviously the demolition of a bridge of this size, one of the longest in the southern hemisphere, requires detailed planning. Greg Taylor explains the complexity of that planning and the time devoted to organising deconstruction particularly the environmental issues. How much of a challenge has it been? Uh, massive. <laughs> Three years in the planning. Wow. Uh, yeah, and I, I believe you know we've got a, a system in place, but it has a major challenge to get here. Mm -hmm. uh, machinery fine-tuned over the years, and uh, we've had to get the exact equipment. Mm -hmm. And the environmental side of this, we knew it was always an issue, so we we've come up with a design that we, we just simply don't drop anything in the water. It's Everything is caught. That is good. The Hornibrook Bridge is, is almost three kilometres in length. How long will it take to demolish and complete the project? Uh, 10 to 12 months. It's uh, weather prevailing and, and a few other things, but um, yeah, we, we, we feel we'll be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And with similar landmarks that have been demolished, there has been an opportunity for the general public to purchase a small part as a memento. To your knowledge, will that happen with the Hornybrook Bridge and how will it eventuate? Uh, yes, it can. The, the, the timber will be, um, it's dealt with through Australian architectural hardwoods, mainly because of the contaminants. Mm -hmm. um, what, what will be for sale will be free of contaminants and uh, either ready for someone wants to make a piece of furniture or have a new floor in their house. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steel-wise, yeah, we'll have, um, if someone wants their fence to come from the old bridge, that's fine. Some of the concrete's already gone out west to Roma to use under a new house. Each of the major components from the bridge has a significant recycling value. Very little, if any, product goes to waste. We would have loved to have kept the old bridge, the old Hornybrook Bridge, but one, it would have been very, very expensive to bring it back to a state of where people could use it safely would also meant that we'd have to cut down uh, many, many trees to uh, replace those timbers. So what we've done is preserved 100 metres on the, the Redcliffe side uh, so that people will always have that uh, link to the old bridge and will really uh, incorporate that into the local community. Great f fishing platform and somewhere that families can use. We'll recycle what timber we can and there are some very good spans of timber uh, within the original bridge that we can recycle or many of our uh, timber bridges across the state. We've got one of the largest uh, timber bridge networks in the nation. Uh, and importantly, uh, we'll give the local historical society some of the timber uh, once we get rid of the arsenic and, and some of those nasties involved in it uh, so that the community will always have a piece of that timber to remember. 
But that's progress and we've always progressed in Queensland. We've got to preserve our heritage where we can and I think the solution, 100 metre portal on that Redcliffe side, uh, using that historical timber, keeping that bridge in place to that length will really be a great addition to the local community. We followed the chain of deconstruction, in particular the timber, to Kempsey in New South Wales, where we joined Juanita Grayson and witnessed the detailed recycling process of the iron bark recently recovered from the Hornybrook Bridge. The rural town of Kempsey is located north of Sydney in New South Wales and about 600 kilometres south of the site of the Hornybrook Bridge in Redcliffe, Queensland. Kempsey is home to Australian architectural hardwoods who successfully tended for the recycling of the timbers from the Hornybrook Bridge. Australian architectural hardwoods have been involved in the industry since 1993. Their experience, along with their association with many prominent architects, has meant the minimisation of the devastation of our natural ecology. Recycling timbers from projects such as the demolition of the Hornybrook Bridge means that there is less timber required from our rapidly decreasing resources. And it produces a quality of product that is second to none. Andrew and Robin Brody, company directors of Australian Architectural Hardwoods, joined marketing manager Jeff Milner and spoke with Anita Grayson about their commitment to recycling timber products. We asked how and why they became interested in this process, and in particular the Hornybrook Bridge demolition. Well, I'm told it's the largest was was the largest timber viaduct bridge in the Southern Hemisphere. Now that's quite quite a statement. Um, we really didn't know what we were getting into until the stuff started turning up and uh, our eyes really opened up because it's turned out to be all class one timbers and um, class one is um, the most durable it's a durability rating and uh, the material was all iron bark and tallowood which are probably the most um, sought after and premium hardwoods in australia and there was nothing else it's all gray iron bark and tallowood and um, yeah, so that was wonderful and the volume is fantastic so we have continued continuity of supply. We can produce a standard section that people can buy and put into their future homes. Um, you know, they can plan ahead and know that we'll have the material there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's opened up a lot of possibilities. What is the process for recycled timber from demolition to distribution? Um, yeah, well that's a fairly big question. Um, Basically, the material comes to us in various states of um, disrepair or, um, uh, you know, affected by the service life. Um, the, the, I suppose the biggest problem is getting metal out. And if we're talking about the Hornibrook Bridge, it's not easy. Um, you know, there are large embedded bolts, um, probably 35 diameter. Yeah, so they are difficult to get out. Um, also, there are spikes uh, in the decking, and a lot of it's rusted off, and so it can be very difficult. But it's you know if we persevere, we can get it done. It's it's not easy. It's expensive to do, but we get it. We can get a great result, and um, we prove this. It's, um, it's yielding a very good finished product. Australian Architectural Hardwoods has a passion for recycling timber and also a commitment to the industry and the community at large. During the process, the company devotes a great deal of attention to safety, training and environmental issues. This commitment carries through to the end client. We need individual skills. It's all hands on this job um, to get the best result from the timber. Every single piece of demolition timber is different. It has to be treated in a different way. You cannot run it through a computerised machine. And um, so, it means we're very labour intensive. There's a massive amount of work just getting the metal out. And um, we find that uh, we're, we can offer a huge amount of employment to the, to the valley. And, uh, and I think, yeah, I think we're good for, we're good for the uh, district. The young people in the area who um, don't have a lot of skills, they come here thinking it's an unskilled job that they can work in and we've been finding that the older um, guys are actually imparting their knowledge with hands-on and teaching them how to um, identify timber, how each piece of timber has its little quirks and uh, we're finding that it's, it's on the job training for these young guys and uh, they're actually staying here uh, being trained and we've, we're actually increasing the skill 
uh, and keeping the, the timber industry alive because these new, new people are coming through and actually learning about the timber. We have um, uh, projects all over Australia that the Hornibook Bridge has gone to. Um, one recent job is in um, the new casino in Perth. It's, um, it's a restaurant over there that there's 650, 680 square metres of Hornibrook timber. Gramwood Flooring is proudly Western Australian, an award-winning company established in 1979 that has progressed into being a leader in the manufacture and installation of timber flooring. Well known in the building industry for the installation of timber floors in large sports halls and commercial buildings, they are unsurpassed in quality. With another innovative project, Gramwood Flooring refurbished the Rockpool Restaurant at the Burswood Casino, Perth. Using recycled timber sourced from the recently demolished Honeybrook Bridge in South East Queensland. Spokesperson Jamie D'Souza explains. It was chosen firstly for its colour. Um, they, the owners were looking for a certain type of colour. Also the splits and all the age look. Uh, it's got bolts, holes and all that sort of stuff in it, which was, is a feature um, just to make the floor look even better. The timber is a tallow wood, which is very, very hard, so that's what they needed for a restaurant. To us, it's, it's, it's important as, as much as the client wants it. Um, they choose, they want to have this, uh, the recycled timber, and uh, that way, because the wave of people that want this now is uh, getting very, very, very uh, high. Um, so the, the green age is coming along with uh, oil and uh, using oil finishes and all that sort of stuff as well. So recycled is becoming bigger. Being a restaurant, um, you don't want clients getting hurt from uh, bits of timber breaking away and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that's why we chose a, a, a hard timber, like the tallow wood, and uh, I think the result is uh, fantastic. How much timber are you going to extract from the bridge? Roast is about 5,000 tonnes of material. And what would you yield from that? Um, we'll probably get something like 4,200 or something like that because of fit, you know, there is, I mean, the bridge has been demolished for good reasons, you know, because there's a lot of um, um, rotting material in there. Um, and of that, of 4,200, we'll probably get around about 2,500 tonnes of finished product, we hope. Jeff, could you tell me um, who is the primary user of the end product? Have you got an example? Well, I suppose um, it all starts, a lot of it starts with the architects. And um, they specify us, you know, for certain jobs. And um, they will get in touch with us in relative to what we have coming in. And, um, you know, we provide samples and until we all agree, you know, the look they're trying to achieve. And then, um, you know, the builder gets involved with the job and then he gets in touch with us and the whole process starts from there. So I'm, I'm pretty lucky I get to see the finished product all the time. You know. Jerry Rees is an architect based in northern New South Wales, a founding member of the Australian Architecture Association, fellow of the Australian Institute of Architects, and former president of the Rotary Club of Sydney. In addition to his broad community commitment, Jerry is also managing director of Rees Architects Proprietary Limited. So what is a Tory gate? A Tory gate, the original intention, it, it comes from Japan, and as you know, Shinto is a main uh, religion there. It's a combination of old Japanese traditions and Buddhism. And birds are sacred in most Buddhist countries, in particular more so than the rest of the animal world. And its very structure, the Japanese had actually little roofs that came out for about a meter out. And that's where all the birds were supposed to roost. So it was for the sacred birds to be close to the temple and roost and be happy. The structure of the property in Nashua, bought in 2008, was brilliantly planned by others, but a harsh and cold statement executed in steel and straight forms. Jerry Rees set out with the intention to add some spiritual meaning to the property by using a highly organic material such as timber, assembled in shapes that are rounded and a strong evocation of old Japanese architecture. 
The placement of this new timber structure, a traditional torrey gate, would give a powerful sense of entry to the residents. But there is no way a fairly fragile structure like this could be built with green timber, being softwood or hardwood, because as you know, green timber tends to move. In other words, to put it simply, it's not dimensionally stable. All timber like this, quite apart from my love for it, is dimensionally stable. So whatever you carve, however fine it is, that's it. It will not move, it doesn't matter how much sun or water falls on it, it's going to stay like this. It's beautiful. And <clears throat> for a structure like this, which is meant to, yeah, hard sun, hard weather, hard winds, it won't change, it'll be the same in 10 years. Architecture has a very essential, crucial role to play in our lives, and we are very, us, architects, are very neglectful of our duty to the people and to the planet. Not in just making things for the sake of somebody's ego or whatever, but create small or big things, preferably out of timber, which will make people feel better. By making them feel better, we're going to help the general consciousness of everyone. Do you feel an attachment to the history of this particular wood? Yes, yes. Um, I'm amazed that through uh, red gum I was put in, <coughs> in, a, in a knowledge of where it came from. There's a big difference. The, the timber I used in Sydney, which I was talking about before, I didn't know. I, I still don't know where it came from. Nobody was able to tell me. And to be able to trace it back not just to the bridge, but getting the timber to get it to the bridge, to then get it to here, I think is fantastic. This is what we're all about as humans. When originally searching for timber, timber for this particular project, uh, initially we were looking for a certain, uh, a certain, um, a certain colour and a certain character that we could uh, really work with in this particular environment. It's a very natural environment. So further research actually found that we had a good level of supply from the Hornybook Bridge uh, and we had a great consistency in that material because there was so, such vast quantities of timber. Uh, from there, uh, further sampling and research uh, through the, uh, looking at the materiality of that, we then found that it was ideal in this particular purpose for our, uh, for our weatherboards and other sort of core elements such as our handrails and so forth. So. The most appealing thing about the timber for me personally is the colour. Um, I love the... Um, I love the way that it uh, almost ages the house and it, and it makes it feel like it's been here for longer than it has. When you look at the structure from outside, it sits and it doesn't look like something that's been constructed over the past 12 months. It looks like something that was meant to be here. And um, you know, the way that um, the colours of that timber just sort of blend with the environment, it's really beautiful. Um, and I suppose I'm excited to use ironbark because of it being um, a hardwood, it, ironbark, because it's tough as nails and we do have a termite problem here so we're not going to um, encounter problems with that because they can't get into it. It's, um, it's really good, strong wood. Well, I think here what we've got is uh uh, uh, a timber that really glows. I mean, it's got a, such a nice quality to it. It's, um, it's, it's been, um, I guess, giving a, a certain, certain warmth and character, which has been difficult to achieve with other timbers. But I think the, um, the, the physical colours, the hues of the timbers, and certainly its workability, which the, uh, which the builders have really been enjoying. Um, so what we've been able to get is certainly uh, particular, particular characteristics of um, bushfire resistance, termite resistance, and that, that typical properties of a class one uh, hardwood, which has been uh, very much uh, an integral part of the building. The reason we decided to go with um, uh, James Cooper at Sanctum Design was because he's a sustainable architect. Um, when you live in surroundings like this, you just um, can't take them for granted. Familiarity doesn't break contempt here, it's just beautiful. Um, and we really tried to incorporate a lot of the building materials from outside 
into our structure. The, the timber being the iron bark um, is something which we're surrounded by. We've got iron barks all around us. Um, and our accompanying valley is called Iron Bark Valley, so it was important we use that iron bark. Um, the sandstones from a local quarry, which sits within the valley itself, um, and with the hydronic heating, which you know, just we can burn the the timber from from the valley that's fallen, uh, and you know, we just we, we just really love the fact that we were able to live in a, a modern contemporary home that also offers some um, sustainable elements. Moreton Bay Regional Council, together with the Queensland State Government, representing the general community, have legitimate demands to retain some heritage value from the Hornybrook Bridge. Father, grant that we who serve you in the affairs of this council may have the wisdom in our deliberations, the guiding of your hands in our day to day decisions, and the grace to serve together to the best of our ability to advance the prosperity of our region. Thank you, councillors, and now the Lord's Prayer. The deconstruction of the bridge, in partnership with Iron Bark Demolition and Australian Architectural Hardwoods, has provided a strong workable relationship, reminiscent of that witnessed by M.R. Hornybrook during its construction between 1932 and 1935. To my mind, I don't think there's uh, any structure uh, that has been built in Redcliffe that will um, have the same impact either now previously or into the future than the construction of the uh, Hornibrook Highway. I mean, uh, Manuel Hornibrook has left a legacy that uh, had changed the peninsula forever, connecting it to the northern suburbs and to the city, and uh, I don't think it'll ever be surpassed. Well, look, I think that the, um, the Hornibrook Bridge has served this community really well. I agree with all of Alan's sentiments that it is the greatest achievement, that it's the thing that's changed our community the most, I think, the most significantly. But I think that it's going to be very fondly remembered forever by people past generations, at this current generation and those to come. I think it is it's got such a great part in our um, history that it won't be forgotten and I think it's the grand old bridge that can now just retire gracefully and be remembered as people go out there and enjoy a little bit of recreation. Prominent in the first part of our story was the commitment Redcliffe City Council had toward the construction of the new Ted Smout Bridge and the care and concern it had for the demolition or deconstruction of the old Hornybrook Bridge. Redcliffe City Council has now been replaced by the Moreton Bay Regional Council, who through the good fortune of election retained Mayor Alan Sutherland. Supported by councillors Jane Horton and Ray Frawley, their interest today in the Hornybrook Bridge project is just as strong. And you know Redcliffe is steeped in history being the first uh, European settlement in Queensland and so that bridge was the longest viaduct in, uh, in Australia when it was uh, constructed and uh, it's good that we do have a, uh, a historical record and uh, this council has been uh, very supportive of this documentary in that we have uh, given funding uh, towards it and uh, that explains Mr Mayor very briefly and concisely why uh, John is here today. And, uh, the structure itself was uh, the longest uh, uh, bridge in the southern hemisphere and remained that way for many many years. Uh, people said when, uh, when he said I'm going to do this they said oh, it'll never work and yet it did, and uh, in the finish, even though the, uh, the, uh, the toll had never changed from day one, it was uh, a shilling in those days, or ten cents uh, for cars, and, and uh, sixpence or f uh, five cents for motorbikes, uh, in all that time that it was up, it never changed uh, uh, the toll, and yet people in the finish were complaining about they're making too much money from this bridge. So uh, just... Uh, sh it stands as a monument, you know, to forward-thinking people and uh, we need more of uh, Sir Manuel type people today. So we come to the end of our journey, a journey that started in 1932. Over almost 80 years we have witnessed the development of a very special community. A community focused on providing its own employment when times were tough. A community that saw a challenge and built a bridge to meet a need. We saw that need flourish and change from a liability to an asset. And today that asset is being recycled and renewed to again serve a future community. During this process we spoke with Reg Jones, one of the original workers on the Hornybrook Bridge. And we met Jack McEwen, whose father Frederick was a timber cutter from the Kilcoy district. 
Roy Atkins and his sister Joy Brennan recounted tales of the time when their father was the original toll keeper. Our story has been one of ordinary folk committed to a project with extraordinary outcomes. A story of triumph over adversity. The Hornybrook Bridge was built when Australia was in depression and provided work to hundreds of unemployed. In turn, the bridge provided a transport link to Brisbane and its northern suburbs, which was difficult prior to its construction. Despite criticism, a toll of 10 cents continued throughout its lifetime. A toll that was equitable and made the Hornybrook Bridge one of the most sound financial investments of its type in the state of Queensland. Even today, the bridge stands as a reminder that the impossible can be achieved and what it is to be part of a community. As the destruction of this local landmark gives life to many worthy projects Australia-wide, it is easy to see that the Hornybrook Bridge is, and always will be, living history.